In the new 2024 protocols, you will find significant changes for both BLS and ALS clinicians in the adult ventricular fibrillation and pulseless ventricular tachycardia algorithm. As a reminder, the adult algorithm applies to patients 13 years of age and older. The pediatric algorithm for patients less than 13 years old is unchanged. Before delving into the modified adult algorithm, we should first review a few key points in the care of any cardiac arrest patient. Immediate high quality uninterrupted chest compressions is paramount and should be the top priority. As soon as a defibrillator is available, the pad should be placed on the patient and defibrillation at the manufacturer recommended energy level should occur as soon as possible. Once high quality chest compressions are occurring and a shock has been delivered, focus on ensuring adequate oxygenation and ventilation. This can occur with BLS airway maneuvers such as an oral airway and bag valve mask. The first few minutes of a cardiac arrest resuscitation do not change with the new 2024 protocol. You should start with high performance CPR, maintain adequate oxygenation and ventilation, and defibrillate as soon as possible. However, the protocol changes if the patient is still in a shockable rhythm after the second defibrillation. After the second shock is delivered, you should evaluate whether your patient is a candidate for transfer to an eCPR capable center. If the patient meets criteria for eCPR, you should start packaging the patient for transfer and think about the best way to move the patient to the ambulance while minimizing interruptions to care, especially chest compressions. However, the patient should not be moved yet. We'll talk more about the specifics of eCPR, including what it is and why we are including it in the protocol in a little while. The criteria for transporting to an eCPR capable center includes having an advanced airway in place. Either an endotracheal tube or a supraglottic airway is acceptable. Advanced airway management can occur during transport and does not need to prolong on-scene time. A mechanical CPR device must be in place prior to moving the patient to ensure continuous high quality chest compressions. The patient must be 13 to 60 years of age. The cardiac arrest must be witnessed by EMS or bystanders. The initial rhythm by an AED or cardiac monitor must be a shockable rhythm. Finally, drive time to the eCPR capable center must be 15 minutes or less. After two defibrillations, start an IV or IO and administer 300 milligrams of amiodarone followed by one milligram of epinephrine. Note that the epinephrine is given immediately after the amiodarone. At this point, you should also consider whether there is a reversible cause of the cardiac arrest such as hyperkalemia or a sodium channel blocker overdose and treat accordingly. If polymorphic ventricular tachycardia is present, you should treat with two grams of magnesium IVIO over two minutes. At your next rhythm check, if the patient is still in a shockable rhythm, then you should defibrillate for a third time and transfer to an eCPR capable center if the patient meets criteria. Communicate with the receiving hospital that you are transferring an eCPR eligible patient as soon as possible to allow the receiving hospital to coordinate the necessary staff and equipment. To put it simply, if your patient meets eCPR criteria, you should start transport after the third defibrillation. If your patient does not meet criteria for transfer to an eCPR center, then you should continue to resuscitate the cardiac arrest on scene and consider alternative defibrillation techniques. After the third defibrillation, regardless of whether you are transporting to an eCPR capable center or staying on scene, you should consider alternative defibrillation strategies. Evidence suggests that changing the path that electricity travels during defibrillation may increase the odds of converting the patient out of a shockable rhythm when multiple attempts at standard defibrillation have failed. The type of alternative defibrillation you perform will depend on how many defibrillators you have available. If you only have one defibrillator, you should proceed with vector change defibrillation. In standard defibrillation, the pads are typically in the anterior lateral position. Apply a second set of pads in the anterior posterior positioning and use this new positioning for the fourth and subsequent defibrillations. If, on the contrary, the first set of pads was applied in the anterior posterior position, then the second set of pads should be placed in the anterior lateral position. Correct pad placement is imperative. Otherwise, the defibrillation is unlikely to be successful. After the fourth defibrillation, administer 150 milligrams of amiodarone IVIO over two minutes. Here we see the standard pad placement. For vector change defibrillation, the standard defibrillation pads are removed or at least disconnected from the cardiac monitor 
and a new set of pads in the anterior posterior configuration are applied. Only in cases where a second set of pads is not available, the original set may be simply moved to the new position. Remember that placement of the first set of pads in the anterior posterior position is also acceptable. In this case, the second set of pads are placed in the anterior lateral position. Here we see a demonstration of vector change defibrillation. Use your jurisdiction's standard pad placement for the first three shocks. In this demonstration, the initial placement is anterolateral. Plan ahead. Begin placing the vector change pads well ahead of the fourth shock. Unplug the initial set of pads and plug in the vector change pads. After the third shock, the vector change pads should be in place. Perform the fourth and all subsequent shocks using the vector change set of pads. Defibrillate at the highest joule setting recommended by the manufacturer. Switching to metamorph rhythm check, all up, clear. Chocolate rhythm, you're clear, I'm clear, everybody's clear. Shock. Jurisdictions that use a mechanical CPR device will need to coordinate vector change pad placement with placement of the mechanical CPR device. Roll. Apply the posterior pad when you roll the patient to position the back plate yeah. under the patient. The anterior pad may be placed either before or after securing the upper part of the mechanical CPR device. Second set of pad is on. Unplugging the first set of pad. On the other hand, if you have two defibrillators available, you should proceed with dual sequential defibrillation followed by 150 milligrams of amiodarone IVIO over two minutes. Please note that an AED cannot be used as a second defibrillator for the purposes of dual sequential defibrillation. To perform dual sequential defibrillation, do not move the first set of pads. Apply a second set of pads in the modified anterior-posterior configuration. Both sets of pads should be connected to a cardiac monitor. Charge both devices to the maximum joule setting per the manufacturer's recommendations. When ready to shock, one EMS clinician will be responsible for delivering both shocks. The EMS clinician should use one finger to deliver the first shock and then immediately use the same finger to deliver the second shock from the second monitor. The reason for having the same EMS clinician deliver both shocks and with the same finger is to avoid simultaneous defibrillation. We do not want both devices to defibrillate at the same time to avoid damaging the defibrillators, but we do want a very short period of time, less than one second, between defibrillations. Let's look at the demonstration of dual sequential defibrillation. Begin uh, placing the second set of pads early so that you are ready prior to the fourth shock. Leave the initial set of pads in place and plugged into the monitor. In this demonstration, the initial pads are in the anterolateral position. The anteroposterior pads should be placed with the anterior pad close to, but not touching, the original anterior pad. Plug the second set of pads into your second monitor. Precharge both monitors to the manufacturer's recommended maximum joule setting. One clinician will administer both shocks. To avoid simultaneous defibrillation, deliver both shocks using the same finger of the same hand, with one second or less between defibrillations. Even if your initial attempt at vector change or dual sequential defibrillation is unsuccessful, you should continue using these methods of defibrillation for all subsequent defibrillation attempts. At the next defibrillation, we have added a new drug, Esmolol, to the algorithm. Esmolol is a beta blocker which can reduce electrical activity in the heart. Preliminary studies suggest it may help to terminate persistent ventricular fibrillation or persistent ventricular tachycardia caused by an electrical storm from increased sympathetic drive. Administer a single dose of Esmolol, 500 micrograms per kilogram, IV push over one minute to the patient with no repeat doses. 
Continue CPR and defibrillation as indicated until return of spontaneous circulation, termination of resuscitation, or arrival at an eCPR capable center. Let's circle back for a minute and talk about eCPR and ECMO. ECMO stands for extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. ECMO is a form of heart-lung bypass that temporarily replaces the function of the heart and lungs. This occurs by placement of large catheters that allow venous blood to be pumped out of the body through an oxygenator and then pumped back into the arterial system. If a patient is placed on ECMO while on cardiac arrest, it is termed eCPR or extracorporeal cardiopulmonary resuscitation. This buys time for doctors to identify and treat a reversible cause of the cardiac arrest, such as an acute myocardial infarction. However, the brain and vital organs quickly develop permanent damage during cardiac arrest, and despite being placed on ECMO, the body may be too injured to recover. Thus, there are very strict criteria for which patients can be placed on eCPR in order to increase the chances of good neurologic recovery. While some hospitals can place a patient on ECMO, only a few hospitals in the region have the resources to perform eCPR. As of this recording, these hospitals are Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, University of Maryland Medical Center in Baltimore, and MedStar Washington Hospital in Washington, DC. If your patient is an eCPR candidate, it is absolutely critical that you notify the hospital as soon as possible. Many resources and healthcare clinicians must be mobilized to initiate eCPR. In summary, we are still focused on providing high-quality CPR and defibrillation as soon as possible. Administer 300 milligrams of amiodarone and 1 milligram of epinephrine as soon as vascular access is obtained, ideally within the first five minutes of arriving at patient side. If your patient requires two defibrillations, evaluate whether they are a candidate for transfer to an eCPR-capable center and start packaging the patient as soon as it is feasible to do so. After the third defibrillation, transport to an eCPR center if the patient meets criteria. The fourth shock should be in the vector change configuration or dual sequential defibrillation if two defibrillators are available. As a reminder, an AED cannot be used in place of a second cardiac monitor. If the patient does not convert with initial vector change or dual sequential defibrillation, continue using vector change or dual sequential defibrillation for future shocks. After five shocks, administer an esmolol bolus. This new protocol is certainly a drastic change from previous iterations. However, we believe that these new treatments for persistent VFib or pulses VTAC will be integral to saving more lives across the state. You and your BLS crew are on scene treating a 55-year-old male patient complaining of chest pain when he suddenly collapses. You determine the patient is in cardiac arrest, begin high-performance CPR, and attach an AED. An ALS unit is en route with a five-minute ETA. Your initial rhythm on the AED is shockable. You defibrillate the patient and resume high-performance CPR, place an oropharyngeal airway, and ventilate using a bag valve mask. Your patient remains in a shockable rhythm, and you defibrillate a second time. At this point, you consider whether your patient is a candidate for transport to an eCPR-capable center. Which of the following are criteria for transporting to an eCPR-capable center? A, the patient must be 13 to 60 years of age. B, the cardiac arrest must be witnessed by EMS or bystanders. C, the initial rhythm by AED or cardiac monitor must be a shockable rhythm. D, drive time to the eCPR-capable center must be 15 minutes or less. E, all of the above. Transport time to the nearest eCPR capable center is 40 minutes, so you determine your patient is not an eCPR candidate. After the third defibrillation, you should consider alternative defibrillation strategies. If the ALS unit has not yet arrived, your choice for an alternative strategy should be A. Vector change defibrillation B. Dual sequential defibrillation using two AEDs
As an ALS clinician, you arrive on scene after the second shock. You quickly gain IO access. Which medication or medications should you administer as soon as possible? A, one milligram epinephrine, B, 300 milligrams amiodarone, C, 300 milligrams amiodarone immediately followed by one milligram epinephrine, D, one milligram epinephrine immediately followed by 300 milligrams amiodarone. After the third defibrillation, you are considering alternative defibrillation strategies. You have your cardiac monitor and the BLS Cruise AED. Your choice of strategy should be A, vector change defibrillation, B, dual sequential defibrillation. A second cardiac monitor is available on scene and you choose to perform dual sequential defibrillation. You have applied a second set of pads and charged both monitors to the maximum joule setting per the manufacturer's recommendations. You should A. Have two different clinicians deliver the two shocks, one immediately after the other. B. Have the same clinician deliver both shocks, giving one shock with each hand simultaneously. C. Have the same clinician deliver both shocks using the same finger for both shocks.